Getting back to the subject at hand, um, last, the last couple of lectures have been on the subject of keeping track of how data changes. Now, for the most part, this was uh, intended as uh, a, a way of keeping track of uh, what kind of data is, uh, what kind of changes are being applied by different processes uh, and allowing multiple different processes or threads or uh, whatever you want to call them, uh, multiple different transactions, uh, allowing them to coexist in the same system at the same time. Now, uh, this is a really nice uh, use of transactions, but it turns out there's a couple of other things that databases need to be able to do. And one of those is dealing with uh, failures. Um, so with a little bit of motivation, let's say we have five transactions going on in the system at one time, uh, time moving to the uh, right in this example. Uh, these transactions start out, uh, they start proceeding. Uh, pretty soon another transaction joins them. Uh, we have now three transactions going on in the system. Uh, after a little bit of time, uh, maybe the first transaction finishes uh, and another transaction enters in, into the system. Uh, so now we, have, we still have three transactions going on. Um, another transaction finishes after a little bit of time, uh, and yet another transaction enters into the system. And this continues. So we, uh, one transaction finishes, uh, you know, everything's happening uh, as normal, time keeps moving forward, and then boom, something bad happens. Uh, so how do we deal with that? Well, uh, for the database to uh, execute correctly, uh, what needs to happen is that uh, these, these handful of transactions that have already finished, those transactions need to be, uh, need to be safe. Uh, if we get back uh, from the database uh, a signal or a commit uh, acknowledged message, uh, that basically means or should mean to us that the data is preserved, that um, that data is stable. Uh, and unless some drastic major failure happens, uh, for some varying definition of drastic major failure, uh, those records, any, any changes that were made by those transactions should be uh, preserved so that at some point in the future when we start the database back up, uh, the, the database should be able to recover from uh, whatever uh, processes it hasn't already uh, completed. Now that's only half of the picture because uh, we also might have a couple of other transactions uh, in flight. Uh, transactions four and five in this example have not yet finished. They've not uh, been given a commit message. And that means that those transactions, those uh, transactions that still haven't been finalized, uh, their effects should not be visible. Uh, so if the database starts back up, we need to be able to uh, undo any sort of permanent actions that uh, these transactions might have potentially performed. So, well, how does this uh, affect us? Well, uh, to get into that, I need to first give you a, a sense of uh, one other component in the database, uh, a component uh, called the buffer pool. So. Uh, most database systems have uh, something analogous to a memory manager. 
uh, basically a component that keeps track of uh, available memory and makes sure that the, the data, uh, that data gets read into memory and uh, flushed out of memory with some, uh, reason, at some reasonable performance. Um, now, there are two main design decisions that uh, go into the design of a buffer pool. And uh, these can be described either, at, um, the, the two uh, behaviors are typically referred to as force and steel. So uh, first, uh, force. Um, you may have already encountered this with uh, project two. Uh, every time you perform a write, uh, that write, some various things can happen. Um, now, obviously, the, the uh, data that you're writing to, you probably want to keep it in memory. You don't want to get rid of it immediately. Uh, but there's a question of, do you want to take that write and make it immediately persistent? Uh, if I write uh, something to memory, uh, basically, do I want to immediately mirror that write back to disk? Now, if I do it immediately, well, it makes the data persistent. But it also means that the, uh, the response time uh, of, for that write, the, the latency of that write, ends up being uh, much higher. Uh, well, disk I.O. Is, is bad. We want to avoid that. The other uh, challenge, or the other uh, design decision that goes into a buffer pool, or one of the other design uh, decisions that goes into a buffer pool, is whether we allow uh, other transactions to come in and steal a buffer page. Um, in virtual memory, you can think of this as, do we allow page outs? Um, so if a transaction hasn't been committed yet, do we allow that transaction uh, to uh, have its, its pages stolen from it and uh, reallocated, uh, its memory pages stolen from it and reallocated to a different transaction? Um, now. Uh, why, why wouldn't we want to allow this? Or uh, you can kind of see up there, uh, we don't necessarily uh, want this because of throughput, but why, why might this uh, not allowing stealing impact the throughput of, of the system? So first off, what kind of transaction model are we using? What, are we, uh, what do we think of a transaction as? A series of reads and writes, just a, a big black box that uh, emits read operations, emits write operations, and then eventually emits either a commit or an abort. Very simple model, very easy to analyze, maybe not necessarily the most efficient model, we'll get into that later, but very simple model. Now, when do we have any way of, in, in this simple model of uh, figuring out when the next read or write is going to happen? And that is not a trick question. Anyone? Like I said, not a trick question. Just trying to see if you're awake. Do I need more explosions? I can. My next uh, presentation can have. Uh, yeah. Well, so the answer is no. Um, we don't. Uh, we don't know precisely when the next operation is going to occur. We don't know what operation is going to occur. These transactions could be uh, arbitrarily long. And uh, because of that, we can't really predict what uh, is going to happen. Uh, we can't really predict what data the, the transaction is going to need. So uh, by kind of keeping all of the pages uh, that a transaction is using in memory without flushing them back to disk, that uh, basically locks down those pages and prevents any other transaction from proceeding. Uh, so occasionally, we do want, potentially, to be able to uh, flush data back out from disk. So here are two different design decisions. Uh, we can either uh, allow, uh, we can allow uh, transactions to uh, sort of buffer writes in memory, so-called no force, uh, or we can allow uh, 
transactions, sorry, we can allow transactions to buffer writes in memory, so called no force. Um, and then independently, we can decide, uh, decide whether we want to allow transactions uh, to uh, steal pages, steal memory pages. So we get this nice little design grid. Uh, we can implement uh, something that every, every time a write is performed, uh, we force that write to disk. And uh, at the same time, we don't allow transactions to uh, steal pages uh, from other transactions. Um, this well, kind of really, really, uh, on the grand scheme of things, is really, really simple to implement. Uh, we don't have to worry about any kind of uh, transaction uh, conflicts, especially from the perspective of, uh, of crashes. Uh, every, single time, uh, every single write doesn't return until it's safe on disk. And at the same time, we don't actually uh, need to perform those writes until the transaction has actually committed. So basically, these kind of combine. And uh, because of that, we don't need to do any kind of, uh, well, relatively easy. On the other hand, uh, it's very inefficient. Um, if we're writing everything to disk immediately after we write it, and if we uh, write, uh, flush everything back to disk every time we run out of memory, that's, that's horribly inefficient. So uh, what can we do about that? Now recall uh, a couple of, uh, a while back, we uh, talked about um, this idea of acid, uh, atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. And we'd like to provide all of those things. So these questions, uh, these, these design decisions, kind of connect to that a little bit. So with respect to, uh, so let's, let's break it down. Let's take a look at each of these questions independently and try and figure out what precisely is the problem that we're, we're addressing in each case. So with respect to uh, stealing, uh, in a, again, uh, with respect to allowing, uh, whether a transaction is allowed to uh, steal buffer frames or uh, paid, cause another transaction to page uh, memory out, um, the problem here is atomicity. Um, so if a transaction pages something out to disk, where is that, uh, that temporary buffer going to go? So if I, uh, a transaction updates uh, a row of data and the, the piece of memory that's storing that particular region of the database, that, that particular region of the table, gets paged out, what has to happen? At least naively. Speak up. Uh, it gets paged. Uh, OK, so you could potentially abort the transaction in its entirety. Uh, you could potentially abort the, the transaction that's holding on to that page. Uh, that's definitely one way of freeing up memory. Uh, it's po that's potentially going to cause uh, some uh, inefficiency, since we're killing this transaction, even though it may never even need to access that page again. Uh, so more generally, how, how, does a, uh, how does virtual memory work? Uh, what happens when we run out of regular memory? Come on, someone in here has taken an operating systems class. What happens when your com whole bunch of people have laptops right here? Uh, what, what happens when your laptop runs out of memory? Hmm? Uh, it, uh, it thrashes, yes. Uh, what specifically uh, causes that? Uh, or if I, at the moment I run out of memory, something happens. You, yes, so your, some of the, the content in memory goes to disk. Now, in a database, all of the, the content that we're keeping in memory, uh, typically we need to persist it. Uh, we're keeping the tables, we're keeping the rows. The, the entire database is sitting in memory, but it's a mirror image of the, the corresponding content on disk. Uh, 
Uh, so when we run out of memory, we kind of need to take that, uh, that mirror image of what's on disk and basically put it back onto disk. So if, if that mirror image uh, hasn't been changed, do we need to do anything? No. Um, it hasn't been changed. We already have a mirror image of it back on disk. We're done. Uh, if it has changed, so if uh, uh, never any chalk. Uh, so we've got our data that's in memory. My really, really bad RAM chip thing here. And then we've got uh, a hard disk. Uh, you know, that probably doesn't look like a hard disk, but whatever. Uh, so this table, this data that's sitting in memory, basically just mirrors some portion of the disk. Now if we change, if we make some change uh, in the memory, that change also needs to get flushed out to disk before we can release uh, that particular uh, region of memory. So what kind of problem does this pose? So let's say we have a transaction. Transaction one comes along, and it makes some change uh, to a table. So right of A. Uh, it makes some change. We've got this. Uh, it has just made a change to memory. Now, what, what do we do with that? What are, what are some options? We need to page it to disk, or s send that to disk somewhere, because we don't have enough memory to keep. Yes? OK, so we could potentially wait for transaction one to, to do a little bit more work, and then eventually buffer a bunch of other things, write those to disk. Uh, you are onto some. Uh, you are onto something there. Um, I will get back to that. Uh, but what if we need that memory right now? What if we uh, we have no choice but to uh, release? Or for whatever reason, this is the least useful piece of memory to us at the moment, and we absolutely absolutely need more memory. Okay, so we have to write this out to disk. Uh, now we have a couple of options. We could either write it out to disk, overwriting the old value that we'd already produced. So remember, we have our mirror image. Uh, so we could either preserve the mirror image. Let's call this change of A, change of A. Or we could kind of keep a separate little repository. And this is more like what happens in a, a regular VM. We write that change to our separate little repository of, of state and free up the memory for ourselves for later use. Now, what's, why might we not want to do the latter? Uh, why, why is writing this, this, object, or this, this chunk of data out um, a, B, C, D, Why is writing this out here a bad idea? Or writing it, yes. OK, so there might be a cost issue. Uh, it might be the case that if we uh, write this out to disk, uh, that's going to waste more of our time than simply trashing the data and uh, Restarting the transaction from scratch. Okay, uh, let's let's assume that that's not the case. Let's assume that there is uh, value in preserving the delta a, and not the original a. So what's going to have to happen at some point? Remember, this is this is the the database. This is not the database. This is just a temporary swap file. OK, so if transaction A, uh, if transaction 1 aborts, what happens? OK, then you have to remove all of the changes. So then we, if we don't care about the change, 
then this can just go away. But what, happen what happens if we do care about the change? Well, then we have this other problem. We have to take this, read it into mem back into memory, and then write it back out. So oftentimes, uh, it is, uh, and again, this is, uh, this is firmly in the it depends category, but um, we can kind of assume uh, that most of the transactions that we perform are actually going to commit. And it's usually a safe assumption. So if that's the case, we might actually want to flush this out in place. We might actually want to keep it uh, in the same place that uh, in the same place that the uh, in the actual database, excuse me. Now, that leads us to another problem. So, what's the disadvantage of of writing the? Where's my? Uh, here we go. Uh, what is the disadvantage of flushing back into the actual database? You lose the original copy. So if there is an abort, um, if uh, another transaction comes along and needs to page this data back in, well, you've just, congratulations, you've just wiped out the original version. Um, so you've kind of not only, uh, not only that, but you've, let's say, the transaction one has also done a write to, let's say, Z somewhere else in memory, uh, a uh, x, y, z. We have another page that's sitting in memory. And then somewhere on disk, we have x, y, the original x, y, z. Now, this database has not been atomically modified. So from the outside perspective, if the system crashes and you're just recovering from this, you have part of the transaction applied part of it not applied. And that's bad. Right. Um, now, uh, the, the force question is also kind of captured in this discussion. Uh, if we want to make sure that uh, the, each of these, these rights happens not only atomically, but happen uh, are kind of guaranteed to happen. But at the same time, if we have one page that's sitting here, one page that's sitting here, and opposite ends of the disk, they, it, it might be the case that the, uh, a write to one of them ends up getting applied, a write to the other one doesn't necessarily get applied yet. Um, that's, a expensive, that's an expensive seek and so forth. So, we're in this, this kind of, we have this kind of problem here where uh, we kind of do want to write to the core database, but at the same time, uh, there's some value in kind of recording uh, stuff off to the side that kind of captures what we're doing with the database. So what's the, what's the solution? Or what, what can, yes? Yes, thank you. All right, so. Um, what can we do about it? Well, rather than, uh, show of hands, who's, uh, who is familiar with the term uh, log structured file system or log based file system? Okay. Can you cover that in operating systems? Oh. Okay. Uh, all right. Well, then, excellent. Uh, this is basically, for all intents and purposes, uh, a lot of this has been adopted by the file systems community as well. So um, take that for what it's worth. Um, so the idea here is that writing every single page, the entire page uh, out to, to disk uh, every time something changes is rather inefficient. You're going to batch, uh, uh, excuse me, it's rather inefficient because Oftentimes, these changes, these little things that get applied, are typically fairly small. And even if they're not small, um, there's usually some advantage to batching these, these changes uh, together. So 
rather than trying to uh, address this issue head on, rather than uh, mirroring all of the, the pages to disk or using a separate swap space, what you can do is keep track of how the data has changed. Right. Um, so a log is exactly what it sounds like. Every time something changes, uh, some ch uh, update gets applied to the database, you record it. And you record just enough information so that you can recover, uh, you can recover from a, uh, both a crash and a transaction aborting. What do I mean that, by that? So, So every time you make a change, write to Z, write to A, you record something. You record, you start building up a record of all of the, all of the changes that have gotten applied. Uh, delta Z, delta A, and then you know other transactions might be coming along. So you might also want to record uh, that this is T1 performing that, T1 performing that, uh, T2 might perform a, a write to B, and so forth. And you just build up this buffer of changes that have been applied to the database. And then as that buffer fills up, you can stream it to disk. And what kind of an access pattern are we going to see with that log? Hmm? A linked list, or more specifically, what kind of disk access pattern is, is sequential. sequential? Yes. So every time we write something to disk, uh, we're always appending. So we're always doing sequential writes. Um, hard disks love these. Solid, solid state disks are also, uh, this is quite nice for solid state disks. Um, even in that case, you, you, there are benefits to sequential writes. So this is a great access pattern for pretty much every form of uh, persistence. So the, the takeaway there, this is reasonably fast. Yes? Sorry, uh, I, should, um, I should correct what I said. Uh, not log structured file system. Uh, thank you for, for catching that. Uh, log. Uh, my, I'm a database person, not a file system person. Um, there, this is not precisely log structured file systems. Uh, you can think of this kind of as log structured file systems with uh, checkpointing, um, modulo a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, yeah. Uh, Sorry, this, this is not precisely log structured file sy systems. Thank you for catching that. Any other questions about this so far? Yes. Uh, say again? Okay, so the big problem here is that we have a limited amount of memory and that mem uh, limited amount of memory exists to mirror what's on disk. And there's an advantage to exists to mirror what, what's on disk. And when what's in memory changes, we need to be able to kind of push that back to disk. Now you can kind of look at what's on disk. Um, I don't know how to put this. You kind of want a canonical record of what the database looks like on disk. Because that means that when you start the data, when uh, the database shuts down, when you start the database back up, it has an efficient way of, of it knows exactly what the structure of the database is. It knows, uh, it can immediately respond uh, to queries by, by kind of identifying which pages it needs. <clears throat> 
the problem is when you start messing around with uh, the data in memory. When you change something in memory, you want those changes to get reflected back on disk. But those changes need to be reflected um, both atomically and at specific points. What I mean to say is that when I hit commit, all of the changes that the transaction has applied need to be applied to disk in one single operation. Now, even if you accept that uh, the granularity of, of each disk operation is going to be uh, a whole page at a time, and if you write a page and get confirmation of that page right uh, back from disk, that that write is safely on disk, you might need to write multiple pages to disk. So you have at least one problem there, um, namely uh, durability. So if, if I perform one of these writes, that's going to modify this sort of canonical image that's sitting on disk halfway. I need both of these writes to complete. Now if I allow one of these writes to complete, then this canonical image, until the second write has, has occurred, this canonical image on disk is incomplete. It's corrupted, if you will. Because it's, it has the effects of one write, but not the effects of the other. We've, we've violated atomicity. Half of the transaction has been applied, the other half has not. Meanwhile, uh, so does that half, uh, the, the atomicity issue, has that half are, uh, been kind of addressed for you? So the other issue is what happens when we need to take some of this memory back. When we don't have enough memory, some of these records need to get flushed to disk. Um, some of these changes need to get flushed to disk. But it might be the case uh, but we want to have some way of preserving those changes so that in the future, when the transaction does actually commit, we can get those changes back and reapply them. So in order to address both of those concerns, what we can do is log every single update that gets applied. Every single time a transaction performs a write, that uh, the effects of that write can be recorded in a, a single region of memory that gets periodically flushed to disk. So we, we append this, uh, this write, or the, the, um, the fact that we are about to apply a write to this log, and as this log grows and gets bigger, it gets flushed to disk. D uh, am I uh, keeping you up to this point? OK. One last sort of optimization is this observation that this canonical image, uh, because we kind of expect that transactions will always commit, or the, the default assumption is that uh, a transaction is going to commit, we want to be optimistic about this. Uh, Rather than flushing, rather than relying on the log uh, to handle virtual memory, we actually, the, the virtual memory kind of, the, we preserve this mirror, Im this view of the, the database file on disk as a mirror image. And every time we flush something to disk, we flush it directly into the database. What allows us to, uh, to do that is the fact that the log keeps track of exactly what we've done. And if we record just a little bit more information, we can actually, uh, if we record just a little bit more information, we can not only use the log to recover from a failed state, we can actually use the log to undo changes that were applied. 
this might become uh, clear in just a moment. So, um, the idea is basically every time you perform an action, you log it. In, in fact, you, you log it, yes? So first off, let me, uh, s um, let me set some basic assumptions. Uh, the, the basic assumption I'm working with right now is that I c um, the hard disk can assure me that a single write has completed successfully. One page has been written successfully. So if I can... Uh, I can flush a bunch of things to disk, and the hard disk will tell me which of those writes have succeeded. And the observation, and uh, again, I've, I've got slides for this, but uh, the, just for, for this diagram, the idea is that because you're appending, you're always appending, there is some point in the log that is considered safe. Everything up to that point, uh, basically everything up to the, the last write that was confirmed on disk, is safe. Uh, the, the log for that sequence of operations is safely on disk. And I won't take any action on the database itself until the relevant portion of the log has been safely stored on disk. So that allows me to kind of mess around with, once, once the log of what I'm going to do is safely on disk, then I can mess around with this database knowing that I can either undo or redo anything that uh, I need to. Uh, okay, so uh, any other questions up to this point? And I'll, I'll, I'll have a couple of slides on this in like two or three uh, slides. Any other questions up to this point? All right. Um, OK, so uh, the, the idea is we want to support two basic kinds of operations. And the first is we want to be able to take a, uh, take a page that has not been successfully updated and update it if there's a system crash. So if the system crashes before I can write this, before I can modify uh, this part of the database, we want to be able to uh, recover the write that should have happened. And the other is if the transaction hasn't yet committed, um, but we still have to write something to this, uh, this part of the database, we want to be able to uh, undo the effects of that write. We want to be able to go back to the older version so that, uh, uh, so that we can, again, have a consistent state. And these two operations are typically referred to as undo and redo, respectively. Or, sorry, redo and undo, respectively. Any questions? Yes. What do you mean by math? Uh, so the, the question is, um, is this, what happens if you have a distributed system and uh, can you use the log uh, in that context uh, to do synchronization? Uh, the short answer is yes. Uh, I'll jump to this because you asked. Um, yes, this is actually known as log shipping. Um, so you can take a log and use the log. The log is, is basic. Depending on what you put in these records, 
uh, they're typically a small, very, very compact representation of how the database is changing over time. Um, I'll, I probably won't have time for this today, uh, but I will get into it. Um, all right. Yeah, replication is, is a really fun use of logs. Uh, all right. So um, the idea here uh, is that we have the ability both to, that we put enough information in this log so that if the system crashes, we have both the ability to uh, roll a transaction forward, uh, applying changes that weren't successfully applied, or roll the transaction back removing changes that should not have been applied. And this also helps us uh, with aborts. So if a transaction aborts, but has already applied some changes to the database, you want to be able to uh, undo those changes. Um, and this is typically referred to as, uh, or the, the first of those is typically referred to as um, uh, recovery. So, uh, yeah, let's... OK, uh, let's take a really quick break and uh, come back here at uh, 5.52. Mm. Moving on, uh, how, what goes into a log? Um, now, the, the answer to this question is really multifaceted. Um, in fact, there's still quite a bit of active research, including some of my own, uh, that kind of tries to answer this question. Uh, but what I'm going to start off with is kind of uh, more of a, a survey of what happens in a traditional database system. Uh, and then later on in the class, uh, well, probably on uh, next Monday, we'll start talking about some more uh, interesting variants of what happens in a, in a typical database. So first off, what goes into a log? Well. What, what do we need to record? What kind of changes uh, to the database might we need to keep track of? There's one really simple answer. Writes, yes. So every time we perform a write, that needs to get recorded. Uh, these are also uh, typically known as updates. What other kind of things do we need to uh, keep track of? Okay, so we might want to uh, keep track of what, get, what goes on to disk. Uh, as we'll see, that actually you can get away kind of without that. Uh, but the word, uh, you, do, you do want to keep track of check. Uh, there is this notion of checkpointing that's not quite uh, related to what gets uh, represented here. I'll get into that a little bit later. Um, but Okay, so updates, maybe we want to keep track of uh, what has been written to disk. Transactions, so we need to keep track of when a transaction has started, and we need to keep track of when the transaction has either committed uh, or aborted, because those are uh, important things to keep track of. Um, uh, let's see, what else? Uh, abort, and of commit. Ah, uh, now, there are two, when a transaction commits, when should we notify, remember uh, last, week, uh, last class, we had this, uh, this notion of uh, three different phases in optimistic concurrency control. The, the read phase, the validate phase, and the write phase. In which of those, phases should we notify the user? Or at which point should we notify the user that their data is, is safe? Yes? Okay, so as soon as, we, uh, as soon as we hit the end of the validate phase, we know definitively whether the transaction is going to uh, abort or commit. Uh, sorry, uh, yeah, abort or commit. Um, so that might be a good place to notify the user. In fact, it, uh, but what is, the, what is the danger of notifying the user at that point? 
uh, fail before commit, or uh, what was your answer? Yeah, so uh, in pretty much the same answer. Uh, you, there's kind of this big chunk of time uh, where you might not actually have any of the transactions effects reflected on disk. How do we get around that? So, log, oh, yes, thank you. Um, so we write, uh, so we need to record that the transaction has committed. And if we've been uh, dutifully updating our log uh, as we've performed these writes, then hypothetically at least, everything that we need to uh, recover the, the rights that haven't been applied should be already in the log. So we can commit not, uh, we, can, we don't have to update the entire database, we don't have to apply all of the changes that we've performed uh, to the database uh, yet. All we need to do is keep track uh, um, yet. Uh, we can tell the user that their, uh, their data is safe as soon as we've kind of recorded that the transaction is going to commit. Now there's a, a downside to that. Uh, we still have to perform the writes. So there's, uh, so typically what you're going to see is that you not only have a uh, record for uh, whether or not a transaction commits or whether it commits or whether it aborts, but also when the process of committing has completed, or uh, as we'll see in a moment, as the process of aborting has, uh, has finished. Okay, um, right. So what happens when a transaction aborts? And again, let's take a look at this, this data as if this is kind of, we have a single canonical view of the database. If you're using uh, versioning or kind of hidden uh, versions, uh, Kind of, in, in, kind of like we talked about in optimistic uh, concurrency control, this, this changes a little bit. But in the simplest view, let's assume we have one single representation of the database in the buffer manager. So what happens? Um, uh, so what happens if a transaction has to abort? Well, all of these changes that we've applied, so we've uh, performed a change to A, we've performed a change to Z. If this is our canonical version, again, if, if we're using versioning or uh, if each transaction has its own view of the database, this changes a bit. But if we're using one view of the database, then we need to be able to undo uh, all of the effects of that database. Uh, sorry, all of the effects of that transaction. We can use the log for this. Uh, so what will typically happen, again, this is kind of what happens in, in a typical database system. Um, not claiming that this is the best approach, that I'm just claiming that this is the most common approach, uh, is that the database keeps track of um, all the transactions that are active. And um, as soon as a transaction needs to uh, abort, the first thing it's going to do is uh, record that that transaction is about to abort. It takes whatever's in the log and it appends a record saying, I am now aborting this transaction and it specifies the transaction by an ID number. Um, and in order to perform this abort, the database is going to keep track of a, uh, it needs to keep track of some metadata about the log. So for each transaction, it's going to keep track of a couple of things. Uh, and the, the most important one is the last law, the ID of the, or the, the position in the log of the last uh, log entry that that transaction generated. Each of these log entries is going to have uh, not only the information about the log itself, uh, sorry, the, the log entry itself, but it's all, uh, where is it? Um, where is it? So 
when I say position in the log, um, a common term for that is log sequence number, or LSN. And the, the log sequence number, um, the, the position in the log, uh, kind of is, is a very easy way to get at s the specific location in the log uh, where a log entry is located. OK, so how do we, how do, we do the recovery? Well, the, the transaction is going to have a uh, record of the last log entry that modify that that transaction generated. So it's going to load up that log entry. And that log entry, one of the things we want to record is not just the, the new state of the database, but also the previous state of the database. So along with the updated value of A, we're also going to record A. Along with the previous value of Z, we're going to uh, the new value of Z, we're going to record the old value of Z, and so forth. These log entries are going to get uh, chained together as a sort of linked list through the log. So every log entry contains not only uh, the updated value, not only the uh, old value, but also a pointer back to the next most recent log entry to get written. And so you kind of just chain back through these log entries and apply uh, every single change uh, back to either disk or back to what's sitting in memory. Any questions? Main takeaway here is just that the log entries, uh, in order to uh, play the log forward, or sorry, to, to, um, to redo operations that haven't been applied, you need the new value. But there's also a benefit to keeping around the old value so that you can quickly go back to the uh, previous state of, uh, of a uh, value in the database or an object in the database. Any questions? OK, so this is an example of recovery when there's no, nothing going wrong in the system. The, the database uh, successfully, uh, successfully uh, uh, got to the abort phase, and nothing else happened. But well, we started the lecture off with a bang. Uh, what happens if there's a crash? So we need to. Uh, we need to keep track of uh, a whole bunch of other stuff in the database in order to, uh, to properly recover, um, recover from uh, a crash. Actually, I'm sorry. Uh, the, the picture that I just, uh, the, the diagram that I just illustrated, the, the entire recovery process occurred with, uh, without any sort of hiccups during the recovery process. So I was able to abort, and then nothing happened during that. Now, data, a typical database, um, and this isn't always true. A lot of the more recent uh, databases kind of ignore this, but uh, database systems ignore this. But what you kind of want to keep track of is, um, excuse me, the, you, uh, if you're kind of relying on the data being completely protected and completely safe, um, you want to be very pedantic about every single stage of the process. Now. In this example that I just presented, nothing happened during the, uh, no crashes occurred during the abort process itself. But we want to be absolutely sure, uh, we want to have a mechanism by which we can be absolutely sure that the recovery itself will not corrupt the data. If the system crashes while we're recovering, we want to make sure that we can recover from the recovery. Um, and 
yeah, I have enough time to start this out a little bit. So this kind of brings us to a uh, recovery algorithm that has been implemented by nearly every single major database system, um, less so in the NoSQL systems, but uh, Oracle, uh, DB2, SQL Server, Postgres, each of them implements this, this algorithm, and it's called ARIES. Um, and the basic idea is to be as pedantic as possible about the recovery process and make sure that there is no possible way that any data loss could occur even if, you're, uh, even if you crash basically at any phase of the process. And the kind of key to this algorithm is this idea of a uh, certain kinds of log entries that keep track of the recovery process. Uh, this is, uh, these are called compensation log records. So as we are undoing changes to the database, we actually log what we're about to undo. We log everything. Um, so the idea is that every time we undo an action, we first log what we're about to undo. All right, oops. Ah. Ah. Okay. Uh, right. So how does that work? Um, so as we are So uh, the uh, okay. Um, so how does this help us? Um, this helps us because as we are, oh, actually, let me let me move forward a couple of slides and then uh, get back to that. So the. Uh, these compensation log records are going to help us as we are recovering from a crash. We discussed uh, how the commit process itself happens. And, right. Where is, there we go. So that, that's the, the abort process. I'll, I'll get back to how those compensation log records help us in just a moment. But first, let me quickly jump back to uh, committing. So to commit a transaction, uh, we kind of mentioned this already, we need to do a couple of things. We just need to make sure that the log is properly flushed up to the point where, uh, up to the, the last operation that the transaction has performed. And Kind of because these operations are sequential, that's a relatively inexpensive operation. We're just doing one big sequential uh, write, and that's uh, easy. The other thing we need, uh, see, right. once we do that, we can return from commit. We can inform the user that their data is safely on disk, and uh, then we just flush everything to disk, and once we have flushed it, we can then write an end record uh, to the log. Uh, let's see, we're running a little low on time. So let me get back to, oh, sorry. Uh, so one other uh, thing that we need to bear in mind as we're building the log, as we're building the log, uh, is that the log is going to get really, really big. So before I get to the actual process of recovery, um, we need to accept the fact that the log is going to get really big and that we don't want to necessarily replay the entire log uh, to recover uh, from a crash. So one other thing that a database is going to do periodically is checkpoint the log. Uh, it's going to uh, assert that so it's basically going to keep two pointers into the log. Uh, 
going to keep uh, one pointer representing what is safely on disk, and it's going to keep another pointer that says uh, what is um, which records are needed. So typically a database is actually going to store uh, typically a database is actually going to store um, the uh, a record for uh, both <clears throat> so At some point, we kind of basically just want to snapshot the state of the database, basically the state of um, where each transaction is, uh, what the state of each transaction is, so that we don't necessarily need to replay uh, the entire log uh, from scratch. Uh, typically, this happens with two special log records, one where we uh, one where we basically say that, OK, now we're about to start a checkpoint, uh, and one that says, now we're going to finish the checkpoint. And the, uh, in between there, we're going to record a copy of basically all of the transaction state, uh, all of the, the kind of uh, metadata that we're keeping track of about each currently active transaction. We're going to flush that to disk in a separate region. And then after we're done flushing it, we record that the checkpoint has been successfully completed. Now, the, there's been quite a, work, a bit of work on, on checkpointing itself. Uh, usually, you don't want to stop the entire system while you're doing a checkpoint. Um, there could be large number of transactions currently active in the system at a given time, and you don't want to uh, stop the entire system while those transactions, while the state of those transactions is getting written to disk. So the reason for that, or the, the, that, that's basically why you kind of have two endpoints for the transaction. Um, well, you kind of mark down when the transaction has started so that you can record uh, basically the, this, this checkpoint of the, the transaction data uh, is valid as of the start, as of the point where the transaction, uh, the, the checkpoint was started, but it's not safely on disk until you reach the end of the process. So it's, it's uh, valid as of a given point, but it's not necessarily, uh, you, you can't assert that it is uh, safely on disk until uh, you have this end checkpoint record. OK, uh, right. So those kind of preliminaries out of the way, let's get to the actual process of recovery. We have this. We have this log, and the log is keeping track of uh, a whole bunch of stuff. Um, there, for the typical Aries algorithm, there are kind of three points that we really care about. Um, so there's some record in the log that represents uh, the, the first log record uh, performed by the oldest transaction that is currently active. This, basically, anything before this point is now irrelevant. Uh, or we, we don't care about anything before that point. Uh, the second point in the log that we care about is uh, the uh, smallest log serial number, uh, the, the first log entry uh, that has not been committed to disk. So kind of at this point, um, if I do a commit, uh, where is it? do a commit, I'll get back uh, a response as soon as all of, as soon as these two log records have been flushed to disk. 
but it's not necessarily the case that all of the corresponding data values have been written to the database. So I need to keep track of uh, the, the last log entry that uh, corresponds to something that hasn't been yet written to disk. And this is going to be the, uh, based on the, uh, the, the pages that are, uh, haven't been, fl been flushed to disk are known as dirty pages. Uh, and then the last thing that we need to keep track of is the uh, last checkpoint that, uh, that got flushed to disk, or that got safely flushed to disk. So the ARIES algorithm, which we'll get into next week in, in detail, basically runs in three different phases. Uh, the first phase is going to essentially reconstruct all of the transaction, all of the metadata for transactions uh, at the time of the crash. It'll uh, go through, it'll start at the last checkpoint, and it'll basically uh, look at all of the log entries and try and figure out what, uh, what has happened since that last checkpoint, and uh, essentially recover the state of every transaction that was pending when the crash happened. Then it will start from, once it recovers that state, it'll try and recreate the state of the memory by replaying all of the transactions that, successfully, that should have successfully committed and should have gotten safely flushed to disk. And then finally, for every transaction that might have applied uh, some changes to disk but uh, didn't commit or uh, we now know won't commit, we need to go back in time and undo the effects of, of that transaction. Uh, all right, we do not have enough time to go through this. So uh, with that, are there any questions? All right, so I'll see everyone on Monday. <laughs>